Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar for Teaching with IPEAL, the International Political Economy of Everyday Life, published by Oxford University Press in December 2022. I'm Sarah and I'm the Senior Portfolio Manager for Podics and IR Textbooks at OUP. Thank you so much for joining us today and I'm really delighted to welcome three of the authors on the IPEAL project, Juanita, Lena and Ben, who are all based at the Department and of Politics and International Studies at the University of Warwick in the UK. So in this webinar, we're going to be discussing the unique teaching approach taken in the textbook and talking about how this approach benefits students who are studying OPE. We're going to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions after the discussion. So please do pop any questions you might have in the chat. So let's start with some introductions. Um, I'm going to ask each author if you could just introduce yourself, please. Um, and say a little bit about your academic background and your expertise. So if we start with you, Lena, please. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, so I'm Lena, I'm based at Warwick. Um, I've been researching and teaching IPE for over a decade now. Uh, my research focuses very much on the, the intersections between finance and development, financial um, uh, market development, and also increasingly Islamic finance. And one of my more recent projects also looks at the kind of like growing Islamic economy. So not just Islamic finance, but also um, food, modest fashion, religious travel, and so on. And um, through that focus on the more like everyday aspects of political economy, I've also become more interested in the kind of like various cultural and everyday approaches to international political economy. And I think that is something that is also very much reflected in the book. And perhaps as another addition to that, a lot of my research focuses or is perhaps inspired by developments in Southeast Asia. So um, I have a bit of a grounding in that region. And I also find that very, uh, important in, in thinking about some of the mainstream assumptions in international political economy and also how we do international political political economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ben, how about yourself, please? Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Richardson, a colleague of Lena and Juanita, as you just, you just heard. Um, my research interests have been in international trade and uh, using food and agriculture really as a sort of case study area to explore issues around things like land rights and labour rights have been particularly important um, and more recently um, diet and um, consumption patterns have become uh, a bit more of an interest to me. Um, geographically, um, uh, I guess I've uh, unintentionally perhaps developed a a particular interest in in the the UK and um, former British colonies actually and the, the way that those um, uh, historical ties have been kind of uh, renewed in the in the 20th 21st century so uh, that's me thank you thank you Ben thank you and finally Juanita please hi I'm Juanita Elias um, so my um, teaching and research here interests lie um, broadly in the area of feminist and gendered approaches to the study of um, political economy um, and have been involved in a, a range of different projects often with um, a geographical focus on the southeast asian region that really um, look at how the kind of gender biases and assumptions that play out in state um, development policies um, are experienced um, by people in their everyday lives. So through things like um, their experience as migrants or migrant activists, through um, things like people's access to um, to housing and uh, mobilizing around um, evictions. Um, and also through things like, you know, women's um, employment in, in garment firms in Southeast Asia. So a lot of my research um, kind of has a central focus on, on kind of women's experiences of globalization and the global economy um, and I've also undertaken work in the UK as well looking at um, kind of political economies of care and caring um, in the context of a sort of crisis of social reproduction um, and I'm just generally very interested in um, kind of concepts like social reproduction how they kind of intersect with um, issues around uh, race and ethnicity and um, how they are um, mediated by uh, by geography and other issues as well. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So let's um, kick off the discussion. Um, the first question, can you tell us a little bit, please, about how the IPO approach came about and why? And what were some of the key challenges that you and your students were facing? And how did these influence the development of the teaching approach? Okay, I think I'm happy to take that question. So it really started very much as, I mean, pre-pandemic, as a corridor conversation. And I think part of that is that we sometimes found that um, our students sometimes struggled a little bit to, to understand some of the quite abstract theories in international political economy and um, also some of the, the historical developments that we often used to introduce important and interesting aspects of international political economy. I mean, even now, I mean, for, for, I think for our generation of IPE scholars, the global financial crisis um, was quite a key moment. But for our students, that ancient history, I mean, at that time, they were not even in primary school, were they? So um, I, I think so, so, so there was a little bit of a disconnect, if you so want, of, of a lot of the kind of theorizing of what IPE was kind of portrayed to be and uh, how students experience the economy in their everyday life. And I think many of us who teach, teach IPE, when students have to select their modules, you always get like a handful of inquiries. Oh, I've never done economics. Can I take your module? Or I wasn't very good at maths at school. Can I take your module? And personally, I find that really, really frustrating because obviously the economy is everywhere around us uh, the financial crisis even if it's ancient history it kind of like triggered a lot of changes so i think those are kind of like uh, rise in tuition fees that impacts uk students extraordinarily very very clearly goes back to some of those fallouts that we saw with the global financial crisis and so i think what we were trying through ip is to kind of reconnect people's or students' everyday experience with the content um, that they were learning. And so it was a corridor conversation. We talked about using images, using film clips, doing IPE a little bit differently. And then we said, why don't we do an app? I think that was like eight years ago or so. Apps were just starting to become popular. Um, it turned out doing an app as a kind of, you know, quite detached from technology person is not as straightforward as it could be. So instead, we created this IP website um, that was launched in 2016. And it was really very popular. So we got a lot of feedback from people using it for teaching, students using it for essays, research, and so on. And um, so, so we were very happy with that. Um, we got kind of positive feedback. And um, then publishers started to approach us. And I have to admit that initially we were very skeptical about doing an IP textbook because the whole purpose of the website was to move beyond textbooks. But then, Sarah, you, you got in touch and you had those kind of great ideas. And so you're thinking a little bit more of, of having something that is perhaps a bit more uh, that, that, that students can look at again and again. Uh, and I think when, when we started writing the textbook, we also kind of started to incorporate more and more exercises. And I think we're going to talk about that later in the um, seminar as well. But I think so a lot of the kind of like book is focused or is organized, not just around those tiles that we also use on the website and then a bit more detailed exploring sections. But we also have those learning activities. And I think that is really something um, where we as the editors also or authors also move beyond that initial website project that we started to work on about eight years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lena. Um, and that actually leads quite nicely to the next question, which um, uh, is that the textbook is organized around contemporary topics such as food, um, debt and social media. And I was wondering if you tell us a little bit about how and why you selected those topics, please. Okay, that's one for me. <laughs> um, so the the topics um, are meant to be heuristic rather than definitive. We made a big play in the website and then in the in the textbook of, of saying that you can use a whole variety of objects, subjects, and practices from everyday life to study IPE. These aren't the most important ones, so um, it's really it's sort of important to to reiterate that. Um, but we chose um, clothes, food, and debt, and we start the textbook with those because they um, resonate most clearly, I think, with some of the conventional themes of international political economy. So trade, production, finance. 
they all provide uh, ready entry points to those more established topics and associated debates. The, the next two chapters are on care and city, and we thought these were quite good because they um, encourage sort of critical engagement or reflection on the typical um, uh, analytical frame that's deployed in IPE of thinking about the interactions of states and markets. Um, that has a, a lot of utility, but um, it can be usefully troubled, I think, by looking at care, for example, because a lot of care work happens outside the market. So how does that frame deal with the form of unpaid labour, for example? And um, City really um, pushes against the usefulness of taking the nation state as the methodological unit of analysis, because often they are um, in, in many ways kind of eclipsing um, um, nation states really as sort of centres of capital accumulation and um, uh, centres of decision-making power. And then the, the final three chapters on social media, share and humour are um, good ways, we thought, of really um, pushing, <laughs> pushing the boat with uh, the IPL approach and, and showing where it can take you. And um, all of them speak in different ways to the importance of online technology in, in reshaping global capitalism and, and our experience of it and with it. And um, as, as Lena suggested, you know, the, the generations of students who are teaching now, you know, <laughs> online technology is, is, is so um, essential to how they live their life. Um, I, I really think we have to move with that as, as a discipline. Um, so they were the topics and um, most of them also map onto our own areas of expertise, although there were certainly a couple of chapters I'm thinking of the one that I led on on City and, and Lena on Share, where we, where we had to do a bit of um, of our own research, really. But to me, that just sort of um, reinforced the, the really nice thing about IPL, which is it just gives you a topic and then and then you kind of run with it. And it was actually quite um, uh, exciting, really, um, to, to, to write that chapter on something that I didn't know that much about previously. Thank you, Ben. Um, and you mentioned sort of you know pushing the boat, and the textbook does go beyond conventional topics to explore perhaps more unconventional IP themes such as disability and sexuality. And I was wondering if you tell us a little bit about the rationale here, please, Juanita. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think one of the things with the IPL approach is, like Ben was saying, it's about kind of just picking an everyday object or practice and sort of running with it and see where you get. But it's also um, a deeply sort of personal and reflective process as well. It reflects a, it's a sort of reflection of the way in which we see our own students engage with questions in the classroom. You know, they apply um, questions to their everyday lives, to the things that they're going through at the moment, and they bring those experiences to the classroom. So it's about kind of saying, well, these experiences matter. You know, when we're thinking about um, the pandemic, for example, um, the fact that many of our students took on um, caring responsibilities for younger si for younger siblings, you know, that's something that is an important, not just an important element of their lives, but something that we can think about from the perspective of political economy and the undervaluing of, of caring labour, for example. So we just kind of felt that, you know, there was a real need to um, make sure that the things that we talked about in the book connected to lots of different issues. Um, so in the chapter on city, for example, um, Ben brings in a lot of the a, a lot of themes around um, disability and access to the city and who the city is for. In the chapter on care, for example, um, you know one of the things that's discussed in that chapter is some of the heteronormative assumptions that underpin care economies and alternative forms of caring, so such as emerged um, during um, the the AIDS crisis, for example. Um, so we wanted to make sure that these were the kinds of themes that were seen as important to political economy. And also the other thing is, political economists are actually writing on these issues. You know, there are, there are queer political economists, there are people writing books about neoliberalism and disability. Um, and we wanted to kind of make those writings that often are seen as quite marginal to international political economy and put them a bit more central um, to the analysis that we were undertaking. Thank you, Anita. And um, 
think about your students, what sort of key skills do you think students studying politics and IR need to develop? And how does IPIL and its approach support the development of those skills? So I think this is one of the key challenges for our students because you study politics and international studies. And, and I mean, it's not just students. We have a lot of joint degrees as well. So you have students like uh, studying history, sociology, who, who also take our courses. And I think in particular, so with politics and international studies, it's not like medicine where you become a doctor or perhaps, and, and obviously that is a little bit, you know, people can have other careers as well, but like law, you become a lawyer and so on. I think with politics and international studies, you, you have a kind of whole range of professional careers that are open to you. And a lot of our students don't necessarily already know what they want to do after they finish their degrees. Um, and, and so I think what we do in this textbook is that on the one hand, we, we encourage them to develop their critical thinking st skills and their analytical skills. But because we have those learning activities as well, so a, a lot of that is then, uh, for example, doing a role play, imagining they're kind of um, working for an NGO and have to kind of put together a campaign um, on, on around kind of sustainable fashion, um, some thought experiments. And so it's these kind of like more transferable skills that we also try to develop. And I think it links back also to what um, both Ben and Ronit have been saying about the kind of like online and online skills. So um, nowadays our students are sitting in the seminars, they have their laptops or iPads open. Um, a lot of the kind of factual information they can retrieve quite quickly. But I think there's a kind of like media, online media competence is something that is really, really important to develop to kind of like how to use those media, how to kind of judge different types of information. And this is also something that students can do in, in doing those exercises that um, or learning activities that we propose in the textbook. And um, I have to say, I've, I've really enjoyed my teaching um, doing those activities. And I, I think another aspect is as well that I'm not sure how much that experience is shared, but because of the cost of living crisis, um, seminar attendance is somewhat more variable. And this is just because some students have to work, then depending on what year they're in, they might have to go for interviews because they have to focus what they kind of career after the degrees is. And, and so um, some of those activities are quite nice because they can be done within one hour seminar. And um, they're quite discrete activities and there's nevertheless a learning curve. So it's, it's not this kind of like directional learning, but they kind of like can test diff out different types of skills through those learning activities. I mean, in the book, in the conclusion, we summarize them as some of those learning activities are more about kind of getting students to reflect on their own experience. Uh, some of them are more to kind of like enact some of those ideas um, that we present in the textbook and some of them also kind of to, to stimulate more the kind of creative side of our students. So to uh, design a meme, for example, um, a lot of that is also engaging, not just with, for example, the city, the kind of in, in Ben's chapter, but uh, in, in the shared chapter, for example, we do a community mapping exercise where, where students are asked to kind of uh, see how far the kind of sharing economy and different types of sharing economy um, are prominent in their student life be it because they're campus universities or, or so, so also kind of relating perhaps somewhat differently uh, to, to, to the built environment that they're navigating. And I've adapted that in one of my modules, for example, that is on um, political economy of Islam. And so I asked my students to do an audit of, of the campus environment and how compatible it is with Islamic principles, such as the prohibition of interest, um, or kind of like, are, are there any social spaces where students can meet and interact that are kind of not so much focus on consuming alcohol and things like that. Thank you, thank you. It's so great to have such um, original and innovative um, learning activities, thank you. And we've touched on this um, next point a little bit, but I want to expand on it. Um, I know that creating an inclusive teaching environment and achieving diverse representation within the textbook is really important to you all. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the work you've done here um, particularly around the scholars that you cite. Just expand on your point earlier, please, um, Juanita. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things I wanted to 
sort of get across was um, one of the things we're really keen to do in this book is to make it really rich and full of examples and really kind of flesh out um, theoretical concepts, relate them to everyday practices and to make sure that we were um, doing justice to <laughs> to the world in a sense, you know, making sure that we weren't just focusing on, you know, what was happening in the UK or North America. So in the chapter on care, for example, um, you know, we can talk about, we talk about, you know, care burdens that are experiencing, experienced during times of economic and financial crisis. Um, and, you know, we use examples from around the world. It might be an internally displaced persons camp in the Philippines, or it might be, um, you know, Greek Greek cleaners who've gone on strike um, um, in the context of, um, of austerity programs. So, you know, was that sense of like we wanted to kind of really make sure that um, we are talking about a wide range of places around the world. And that was something that we kind of did as a team when we read each other's chapters and we kind of audited them and said, you know, this chapter is a bit Western centric. You know, are there other examples that you can use here? It's also reflected in the choice of images. Um, that we use in the text. So photographs are really, really important to this book, how things are visually represented and trying to ensure that, you know, we were picking up images from a wide range of places from across the world. So I think that's part of what we were doing in terms of, you know, how we represent the story of IPE, but it's also about citations. And that's something I already mentioned, you know, there's a lot of people who do really, really fascinating and interesting um, political economy work who, may not identify as IPU scholars or may do work that's seen as very marginal to, you know, the mainstream of international political economy. And so that meant that we, so on a very basic level, one of the things that we wanted to do was to ensure, um, you know, a very good level of citational representation of female scholars and um, scholars from the global south. And we had a kind of ballpark aim to have around about 50% of um, the scholars that we cite um, as women, which I, I think we got to. Um, it's kind of always a bit challenging once you get to the editorial stage to um, ensure that you know everyone gets left in. Um, but yeah, to make sure that we um, were bringing in um, bringing in work from scholars that may not normally get cited in an IPE textbook. So kind of recognizing how. IPE textbooks can play a role in kind of shaping and defining the field of what IPE is and kind of rethinking the idea that there are scholars who are a marginal to the work of IPE and kind of putting their ideas much more centrally um, within, within the textbook. And that's also about um, recognising that, you know, there's really important work going on by scholars who may not identify as international political economists. They may be sociologists, social anthropologists, um, urban geographers, you know, whatever, but kind of recognising the value that this, this work does in terms of kind of enriching international political economy and perhaps seeing international political economy as a more interdisciplinary um, endeavour. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we've heard a little bit from Lena on this, but I was hoping, um, Ben, you could touch on this. For, for lecturers who are looking to integrate the IPL textbook and approach into their teaching, can you just talk us through how you've used it with your students and perhaps any practical guidance you might have on using it in different ways or perhaps at different levels? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so there's, there's sort of four um, broad ways in which you might deploy the, the book. Um, pedagogically and they overlap to, to an extent. So the, the the first would be, I think, just to sort of liven up lectures a bit. Um, this is, you know, sort of a, a low level usage, I suppose, where um, hopefully the book, as uh, Juanita was just suggesting, um, is a good source of, of examples, really, illustrative examples for the kinds of um, topics you want to cover. So, for example, if you're doing stuff on um, the capitalist state or, you know, the production of space, which, which are pretty sort of um, uh, lofty <laughs> concepts to, to deal with, you know, you could, uh, via the chapter on cities, end up just talking about mega events and the, the Qatar World Cup, for example, might be a good way to uh, get students to think about those um, uh, concepts in, in more concrete ways. Hopefully, the multiple choice questions would be a good thing for people to throw into lectures. So we were a bit skeptical about these, 
but I think we were um, well won round by um, <laughs> by <laughs> you and your colleague Sarah uh, because the as Lena was saying earlier, you know the the idea of you know getting students to learn facts, I just don't think really is a worthwhile endeavour anymore in an era of instant information online. But the the way we've designed the multiple choice questions is intended to be more thought provoking, where there is a single answer, or more reflective, where some of them don't have right and wrong answers. They're just about understanding the perspective that you're coming from. And I, I did try that in the class actually, a big lecture, and it I think it went down quite well actually. I could well. I sensed a lot of uh, <laughs> murmurings of, you know, the, the thoughtful kind <laughs> going on. Um, so that's the sort of first thing. The, the second thing is um, as a source of classroom exercises or assessment methods. So there's 17 learning activities throughout the book, all of them different. And what we really hope to do here is to just provide um, people with a with a bank of ideas, really, to draw on, not not to replicate these learning activities exactly as we've written them but just just to um, uh, suggest really what different ways you might engage the students I've got a, a deep-seated dread of a silent seminar class so for me some of the activities that are kind of uh, require little preparation that you can just drop into a seminar and ask students to do on the spot things like um, a, a thought experiment or or a, a quick kind of role play exercise they've been really good um, others require a bit more effort so um, in the care chapter um, there's uh, an activity on uh, social annotation where you know multiple students comment on a single policy document and that's something you could do as a flipped classroom exercise where you you get them to do that before the seminar or, or class and then discuss it discuss it in there with them and then some of the learning activities could be deployed as assessments where they sort of more obviously fit with established marking criteria. So the clothes chapter's got a, a, an activity around um, a, doing a podcast. So, you know, we know one of our colleagues in, a, in another department uses that as an assessment. That's been really worthwhile for everyone, I think. So the third thing is to, is to just have the book as a key reading for a single week if you're doing a, a course on international political economy and you just want to have one week on everyday IPE or something similar like cultural political economy I think the introduction to the textbook could be a really good overview for students wanting to know what that approach is about who's involved with it and what what they were trying to achieve by doing um, cultural political economy or everyday political economy and the, you know the theoretical lineages it draws from. Um, so hopefully the introduction might serve a particular purpose as well. And then finally, if you want to go all in <laughs> uh, as a sort of signed up fan of IP, or you, you, it could, I think, work quite well as the basis for a, a, a module, um, a, a one term module, probably, you know, something around 10 weeks. Um, and you could orient this either to new students by focusing more on the the introductory sections of each of our chapters, which are just intended in to sort of grab your attention with a particular example from everyday life, a case study, if you like. Or for students who've done IPE before and, and want to push themselves more, the, the latest stuff in the chapters where we sort of ask them to explore particular questions, I think could be a good way to sort of build on what they've learnt already in, in more conventional modules, perhaps. And then as a sort of capstone assessment, the, the conclusion asks students in the learning activity to write their own IP or tile, we call them, what basically an equivalent of, a, of an entry on the IP or website, quite a short piece. But I've seen lots of um, people in other universities use this as a kind of assessment method where you just ask students to pick something that they're interested in and, and write about that. It seems to be so much more rewarding for the students because they can follow their interests for the marker because you don't have to mark the same essay 50 times and also it's a lot more kind of plagiarism proof i suppose in an era of chat gpt i think that's sort of an increasing thing that we have to bear in mind so they were the four ways you might find it useful to, to draw on the book here that's fantastic thank you ben and thank you to all of our authors for those very informative and helpful responses 
Um, we're now going to turn to the um, audience for, for any questions you might have. And I can see we've got one posted there already. Um, this is actually from Jasmine at OUP who asks, can you tell us more about how you got students involved in the creation of the resources um, and the different resources available through the book, please? Who would like to have a go at that one? Okay, so I'm happy. I mean, it connects a little bit to the origin story of the IP. And, and this is because when we started the website project, we had funding from the Warwick Institute for Advanced Teaching and Learning. And one of the conditions of that funding was that kind of students would be involved as co-producer of knowledge. And so for the website, we had a, um, a student advisory board. And when we started the website, our idea was to have short entries of around 6,000 words. And our students said, no way, 6,000 words is no short entry. So this is how we ended up at the kind of like 2,000 words format. And, and, and I mean, that is the format to also um, kind of replicate for those entries that um, the, the, the kind of everyday objects and practices with which we start the chapters. And, and, and so pretty much since the beginning, kind of student feedback and input and co-production co of knowledge was, was really very integral to IP. And um, then when we were writing the chapters, um, we had students who, who very kindly also read the chapters for accessibility, because it's not just the, the word length that might make something not so accessible, but obviously also the writing style. And again, that was very helpful because those were students who did not necessarily have a background in IPE. Some of them did, but not all of them. And so just kind of like force us perhaps to be clearer in our writing than we would usually be. And so I think at, at the very beginning, I mean, we wanted to include learning activities, but we did not think that the learning activities would be such a significant part of the book. That is something that only came about as we were writing it and wanted to kind of move beyond the website, but also a little bit guided by what the students found most exciting. And so they kind of then also started to go through all the learning activities. Some of the learning activities we realized were, were just not feasible uh, for the sort of textbook. Um, and, and so they kind of helped to create those resources. And also, and I think that is quite nice with the book. So it has those podcasts. It has both the author podcast and the ideas here. If students, I don't know, they're on the bus on their way to the lecture, they might just want to listen quickly to, to, to what the chapter is about. But then we also have student podcasts and, 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 and they're quite helpful because the students go through some of those learning activities, but they also interpret them in their own way. So I think that is, you were again, a little bit hesitant. So if you provide those podcasts, is that off-putting for new students being asked to do the same exercise? But I think in the end, because our students so much made those podcasts their own as well, um, we, we were less concerned about that. And, and I think it's just a good example to really show how, how enjoyable it can be and how, how students also really like to engage it, but also how they bring very different perspectives to it and, and, and read those activities perhaps also differently. I, I mean, they were intended in an open-ended manner anyways, but perhaps they, they read them somewhat differently from, from how we thought they would engage them. And, and again, I, I think it contributes to this openness and, and this encouragement for students to kind of learn in their own way. Yes. And some are more like visual learners, audio learners, and so on. And, and, and so that is something we wanted to um, stress as well. But it, it was nice, again, then also to get the student feedback. And of course, I think most of we all have been using the learning activities and chunks of the chapters for the last three years or so in our teaching. And so, I mean, there was the student, the, the, the podcasters and, 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 and readers, but all our students over the last two or three years at Warwick and, and when we were teaching elsewhere, that they have been very heavily, unintentionally perhaps on their side in, involved in, in shaping our thinking and, and helping us to, 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 producing, to produce the final textbook and resources. Thank you, Dina, thank you. Um, we've got another question, this is from Sela saying, do you have any thoughts on how the book might be used across other disciplines, so for example, um, for perhaps a sociology student? Could I take this one? Uh, yeah, I can, um, I can do that one. Um, I'm going to try to uh, share a screen. So, um, 
hopefully you can see uh, this. Is that right, Sarah? Is it coming up? Can you give us a thumbs up, Sarah, if it's uh, visible? Yeah, oh, great. We're working. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> OK, so um, this is a, um, a, an outline of the, of the book, um, the, the chapter topics and um, the, the concepts they relate to and the kinds of questions that we um, encourage students to think through and then the learning activities that we tease out at the end. So um, as um, Juanita was saying earlier, you know, we, we deliberately wanted to have um, a, a broad understanding of international political economy as a, as a field to which scholars from all different disciplinary backgrounds can contribute. So I would, I would sort of say to uh, people who are working in um, cognate departments to, to politics and international studies, which is, which is our one, to, to use this book less as a, a way to sort of get a, an orthodox take on IPE and, and how, it, how it should be done. But, but rather to think, oh, these are some debates that this group of scholars are having. Uh, we can feed into that too. We can we can sort of contribute and enrich that. And, and a, a good way to do that will be to kind of identify a, a, a similar concept or question that, in this case, Sarah, in regards to your question, sociology deals with, and um, uh, use that as a sort of jump off point. So. Um, we actually draw on the work of uh, one of our sociology colleagues in the um, chapter on clothes when we're looking at how is desire manufactured um, because this um, spoke in particular to um, uh, sociological ideas I think around um, um, uh, how one presents to, to other people and the kind of the, the work that goes into that and you know sort of attachment to, to brand and all, and all the rest of it. So um, there are lots of um, uh, these connection points out there. So um, yeah, hopefully the, the book sort of invites people into these to these um, interdisciplinary debates. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. Um, to see if there are more questions, I've actually got a question for you, which I'd like to, I'd like to ask. Um, what's been the most rewarding part of using the IPL approach in your teaching? Who'd like to answer that? Anita? I can take that. I mean, I think part of it is just about um, kind of giving you the confidence to um, try um, alternative um, ways of um, developing sort of seminar activities and that kind of things with students. So, you know, doing I've done things like thought experiments. I've got students that undertake their own time use survey. I've, had, I've, had, I've run kind of like show and tell sessions, that kind of thing. Um, but also in terms of you know, more conventional seminar activities like student presentations, I've kind of, you know, conveyed to students that um, what I really want to know is, you know, what unique spin they can play, put on this topic, what they can bring to it. Are there fascinating examples that, they, that they've come across or things from their everyday lives that they um, feel confident about talking about in the classroom in relation to this topic. So, you know, enabling them to kind of see how what might be quite a dry topic, you know, connects to them in some way. So I think that's really what the, the IPL approach is, is all about. Um, and in a sense, like Ben was saying, you know, the topics that we chose for this book are, are illustrative topics. They show you what is possible with an IPL approach. It's not to say, you know, if you wanted to teach um, a class on the, you know, the international political economy of everyday life that you'd have to cover, um, share, humour, clothing, city, you know, it, it's not a set topic list. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of an ethos, it's an approach to teaching, which I think makes, um, makes teaching international political economy much more enjoyable and much more engaging and also, um, connects with a wider group of students as well. So I think there's a kind of um, inclusion type of agenda, um, which is implicit to um, IPL as well. Absolutely. 
Um, and as we come to the sort of closing stages of the webinar, I was wondering, um, Lino and Ben, did you have any uh, further comments you wanted to add or any further points or any to anything else you'd like to add um, to any of the questions we've seen, seen before us? Um, only, only just to reiterate uh, what Juanita just said, the, the absolute best thing about the whole project is the payoff in the classroom when you, when you see students getting into the, the topic, uh, the, the, the subject field that, that you love yourself. I don't know what more you need, really. That's, really, that's, that's it. That's, that's really lovely to hear. Really lovely to hear. Um, I'll just check and see if we've got any more questions. I think that's covered all of them. So I just want to say thank you again to all of you authors for such a helpful discussion and, of course, to our audience um, for engaging and for your um, participation. Um, and, yeah, I hope you will enjoy the session and we'll close the webinar now. So many thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.